Good afternoon, everybody. I'm so delighted that you could be here. And um, Eddie needs no introduction, but everybody likes an introduction. So I'm going to give him one. And you're going to have plenty of time to hear him talk. <laughs> Eddie is the James McDonald Distinguished University Professor at Princeton University. He's the chair of the Department of African American Studies. The two books that will be meandering around today are Begin Again and Democracy in Black. And Eddie and I met on a TV set uh, for MSNBC. We, we became TV friends and then real friends. But I don't think I'm giving away a trade secret to tell you that when you're on cable television, you're not really listening to the other guests. You're waiting for your chance to speak. But I found that when I was on with Eddie, it's like I started listening. And then I started learning things. And then he was saying things that other people didn't say. And that's a lot of what we're going to hear today. Um, Begin Again, which I've been reading, is a, is a beautiful and powerful book. Um, and it will take you back to James Baldwin. But the thing that's so powerful about it is that Eddie goes one-on-one -on -one with Jimmy Baldwin. And it's a tie game, as far as I can tell. And that's really high praise. It's, wow. It's, wow. it's a beautiful and powerful book. And I want to start there. Um, with a pretty simple question. I'm going to read something that frames it. We are living in a lie that we tell ourselves and each other, and it is killing us. We have yet to tell the truth about race in America. What is the lie? Well, first of all, let me just say it's such a delight to be in conversation with you, Rick. Uh, I've been TV friends, friends. I've been reading you for a number of years. Um, and to hear you say those things about my work, um, I want to go call my mama and let her, <laughs> let her know. So thank I spoke you. to her this morning. So <laughs> Thank you so much. And it's so good to be here with you and to see some old friends. Um, the lie. The lie is this broad architecture uh, that feeds into a story that we tell ourselves to protect our own innocence. It's this idea that some people ought to be valued more than others because of the color of their skin. And we tell ourselves a story about those people who are devalued, who are generally disregarded, in order in some ways to protect our innocence and to ensure our salvation. And so the lie is this, this story that is part of the myth and fantasy of, of, of the US. And it's at the heart of a kind of madness, it seems to me, right? that we tell ourselves the story of who we are that is not shall we say, consonant with how we actually live. And it's precisely in the gap, you know, the, the chasm between that statement of who we take ourselves to be and who we actually are, that the lie does its most insidious work. And it's, it's there that I want to mind in the book. I want to think through it in some ways, right? Are there times that the lie can be beneficial, that we do tell ourselves a story that maybe it is a myth, but maybe that's the way to get out of the situation that we're in. Yeah, I mean, every, you know, America's not, I said this, it went viral, I said this on Nicole's show, you know, America's not unique in its sins, right? We're not unique in, in the stories we tell ourselves, right? It's part of national histories across the globe uh, that uh, certain myths work uh, to consolidate a sense of self, an idea of, what it means to be a virtuous citizen, what does it mean to be in communion with others. So the U US is not unique in that regard. But I think, how can I put this? You know, Thomas Carlyle used this language of Britain needed to tell itself a story as a kind of Bible. Because Carlyle insisted that uh, there was divine providence at the heart of, of the history of the UK. And I'm of the mind, and of course, he's, he, he says this in shooting Niagara, right? In shooting Niagara, where he's offering a justification for slavery in interesting sorts of ways. So telling American history as a kind of Bible secures our innocence and ensures our salvation. But what does it mean to tell our history as a kind of fall? Mm -hmm. Not as a kind of Bible, but as a kind of fall. And for me, the fall is all about us. It's not about providence. It's about falling finite, fragile human beings, making choices, making wrong choices, trying to figure out how to be together. So if the lie keeps us from seeing 
how fallen and fragile and finite we are that keeps us kind of secure in our illusions, then it's distorting and disfiguring more than enabling, if, that, if that's. So part of my task as a kind of critic, as a kind of witness, is to understand the usefulness of lies, <laughs> but also to understand uh, the role of bearing witness to the truth of those that the lies obscure. So uh, one of the things that both you and Baldwin write about in Begin Again is that it's not how the lie hurts people of color and black people, but how it hurts whites. Mm -hmm. And that the, in some ways the lie is created to uh, allow white people to not have responsibility or to, or to, or to believe this myth. Talk about that a little bit. Yeah, so, you know, there's the, the lie, which is the kind of the consequence of this value gap that's at the heart of democracy in black. And the value gap is this belief that some people, this practice, that some people ought to be valued more than others because of the color of their skin. And, and that valuation then impacts the distribution of advantage and disadvantage, benefit and burden, right? It distorts the character of those who hold the view. To believe that, to enact that, right? If, if there is um, something is bereft in the idea that you, because of the color of your skin, somehow you are better than somebody else. And to justify that by leaving them to languish in poverty, by shutting off opportunity for their children, by not seeing their children as children, right? That you can tie a cotton gin fan around Emmett Till's neck and beat him beyond recognition and throw him in the Tallahatchie River when he's a child. Or you can see Tamir Rice and see a 21-year-old as opposed to a child. There's something, Toni Morrison uses the language, right? There's, there's something that is maddening about that. That's not just simply about those who have to bear the burden of the view, but what happens to those who hold it, excuse me, to those who hold the view. Something happens on the inside. So I use this in my talks around the country. Even Abraham Lincoln couldn't become the man that his conception of democracy required because he was all too willing at times to throw it away because of his commitment to the idea that some people, because of the color of their skin, ought to be valued more than others. So it's this distorting effect. It's not just on me. It's also on you. Baldwin says this. He says, I've never been the N-word. I've never thought of myself as the N-word. The question is, why do you need the N-word in the first place? So I'll give the N-word back to you. Who's really the N-word? So the question becomes, the problem isn't me. It never has been. But you have me to believe that it's me. Right? Why? And I think, how does one interrogate that with the level of honesty and sincerity um, and love to open up space so that we can imagine ourselves together differently? And, and you do talk about love in the book, and, right. and as Baldwin talked a lot about love, whose vision was uh, not an optimistic one. <laughs> and uh, Eddie chided me for saying he was pessimistic yesterday. He said, I'm not optimistic. Um, but you have a beautiful passage in the book where you compare the time, Baldwin's time, where he became dissatisfied and disillusioned with the civil rights movement oh. to our time now. And I'd, I'd love you to talk about the similarities and, and what you see now yeah. in our society that um, you, know, you point out with great honesty and clarity. Yeah, I mean, when I think about the, the different context for writing democracy in black and begin again, I'm writing democracy in black in the, against the backdrop of the first black presidency, um, Obama's ascendance, um, declarations that we need to no more excuses. You know, put this behind you. You know, uh, we've turned the corner with regards to race, and I'm dealing with the great uh, recession and what it's doing to black communities. And uh, 
we haven't seen, we didn't see that kind of loss of wealth since the collapse of the Freedmen's Bureau with the housing market collapsing, looking at what's happening across the country and trying to write into that fog, as it were, and then begin again. Begin again was against the backdrop of in the, uh, after the election of Barack Obama, the country then vomits up Donald Trump. And then I have to figure out how am I going to raise my kid in this? I never thought, I never believed, and I should have, that the country would elect someone so clearly unqualified to be the President of the United States. Everything in my training, everything that I've read would suggest why would I not believe that to be so? But I didn't believe it. And so I was in despair. I needed resources to figure out how to speak back to the moment because I'm sitting here at my study going, they've done it again. They, they're doing it again. And now my baby is going to have to grow up in this. What am I going to do, right? And so I knew Baldwin, you know, had to grapple with his own sense of despair. The late Baldwin is often talked about as being in decline. He succumbs to a kind of rage and the propaganda of the politics of the moment. So people don't really read, or they didn't really read at the time, seriously, No Name in the Street, or The Devil Finds Work, or The Evidence of Things Not Seen, the latter nonfiction, right? Um, they didn't read the, they thought the, the later novels weren't as craft, you know, indicative of, of the mastery of craft. They were too quick, you know, they were too polemical and the like. And I wanted to say that those judgments weren't necessarily about the work or about Jimmy, but really about the people passing the judgment. That folk were more interested in Bill Cosby's sweaters than they were in what James Baldwin had to say at the time, right? Remember, we were all fascinated by what he was wearing and the like. And so I knew he, had, he was offering resources. How, how do I continue to bear witness in a moment when they are doubling down on their ugliness again. And Baldwin said, you know, maybe you can find something in the ruins, the ruins that was his life. And I'd been teaching him. And so I went there. And I drank too much Irish whiskey. Um, I barely survived. The scaffolding of, of my life almost collapsed as I was working through it. Um, and I found language to, to, this, to talk about what it would mean for the nation to elect Donald Trump now. Because quite as is kept, Baldwin was asking the same question. What does it mean that, the election, that these people would elect Ronald Reagan now? Because for black power, Ronald Reagan was as notorious as George Wallace, right? He was that dude. And so it was through excavating his writing and his life that I, I thought I came up with something that I could say. And that's the title of the book, you know? Right. And the title is optimistic. I want to I go back to... Uh, hopeful. To, hopeful. Thank you. <laughs> I'm going to get rid of those two words. Um, I want to talk about Donald Trump and talk about Barack Obama. In Democracy in Black, you talk a little bit about how Obama is not so much a false prophet, but that it allowed people to think everything was fine. We've, we've moved past the racism and the prejudice, um, and that clearly wasn't true. He, he was not a vehicle for all of those um, ideas. In Begin Again, you talk about Donald Trump as a kind of false prophet of that we can't just blame it on this one man, right. that he is a symbol of something else, and that there are so many people on the left who focus their fury on him but neglect what he represents and what it means that the country did elect him. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we, we've spent a lot of time on TV talking about Donald Trump, All but it time. made me think, you know, maybe that wasn't time so well spent. Yeah. I mean, I think those to focus on the two figures in the way that we did and the way that we do is indicative of melodrama. You know, melodrama is 
you know, char what's characteristic of melodrama is what obvious heroes and villains, you know? And the obvious villain bears the burden of our sins. We can just displace them onto, you know, it's all we need to do is see the back of Donald Trump's head, to put it in, in the language of my hometown. If I could just see the back of his head, then everything will be fine. Right? So he bears the burden of our sins. Obama, he's the hero, the angel, the, the angelic figure, the good. And so we can green screen him and make him representative of all that we aspire. So Obama jumps in front of you know, the anti-war movement. Remember the, the Iraq war and all the things that, all the folk who were organizing and mobilizing and suddenly Obama gets green screened and he jumps in front of that energy. And no one really interrogated what his position was in interesting sorts of ways. I mean, I actually was even stronger in my critique of him. I got in so much trouble for this. Yeah. I called him a Melvillian confidence man, selling the snake oil of hope and change. <laughs> right? I was really, really angry in some ways at how he was being used and how he used his being used, right, to obscure what was happening on the ground. Right? And so adolescents tend to think in melodramatic terms, where the moral world is clearly evil and clearly good, right? And that we just simply make our choices. But human beings are so much messier than that. And we are. America is not inherently good. We're not the shining city on the hill. Nor are we evil, unadulterated evil. Nor are we just simply bad in everything that we've done. No, we are complex human beings. We're a complex country. And what we experience is not the consequence of one person. It is a reflection of who we are. This is why I said, this is us. And it went viral, whatever that means, right? <laughs> this is us. Donald Trump is us. I didn't say he just showed up and then took over our institutions. I said we vomited him up. He's in our gut. I used the language on purpose, right? He's us. And I think um, until we admit that, oh my God, we're in trouble. Because then it, causes, it, re it requires that we not displace everything onto him, just as we do with the South. We displace our sins onto the South. Right, that backward region who, that really refuses to, you know, address its sins. If only, you know, Gunnar Myrdal, if only this region would embrace democracy, live up to its ideals, and its then everything would be well. You believe that, I got an affordable house in Brooklyn to sell you. <laughs> right? And so, you know, let's put a melodrama aside and deal with the tragic comic nature of the life that we live. Um. You're, I'm pivoting off of the last comment. You talked about theater, but all through this conversation, we've been talk, you've been using words like fallen and good and evil and the shining city on the hill. You were a religion professor. Uh, your doctorate is in religion. Yeah. Um, Baldwin is deeply affected by religion. You're deeply affected by it. How, how, do, you, how do you see this? Do you see any of this in religious terms? I mean, you were just describing it in theatrical terms, but you obviously see it in religious terms as well. And is there hope there? Yeah, so, yes. And when I say religious terms, I don't mean doctrinally, in terms of doctrine or dogma. Right? It's, for me, my point of entry is always a moral and ethical concern, rooted in who do we take ourselves to be? the kind of human being that is coming into the world. Uh, what shapes us? What is our understanding of the good? What is our understanding of the right? That is to say, what does it mean to be virtuous and what does it mean to be just? And religious vocabularies offer us languages to talk about these things, right? And so my point of entry into politics has always been and will always be this moral and ethical concern that these ways of being in the world distort our characters. Right, distort who we take ourselves to be, such that we cannot right, be the kinds of virtuous people that democracies require. Right? Because we're so willing in those dark moments, and not so dark moments, to throw it all away on behalf, 
in behalf of, on behalf of, of an idol, right? the idol that has threatened to overrun this fragile experiment since the beginning. So religion as a point of entry for me right, is critical. And it is shaped by not only my formation as a, as a black Catholic on the coast of Mississippi, right, um, and shaped by the fact that I was baptized in Baptist waters at Morehouse College, right, is shaped by an overarching concern uh, about being better people, rooted in decency and love and a recognition of the dignity and standing of every human being, no matter their color, no matter their gender, no matter their zip code, no matter who they love, no matter their ability, but recognizing what the formulation that we're all God's children actually means. Right? Think about this for a quick second. In the context of slavery, a condition of utter domination in so many ways, this religious language, this Christian language is given to that enslaved human being. And they hear the language of acts. God is no respecter of persons. And that formulation is then absorbed and taken in and deposited in the heart. And so this relationship of master and slave is suddenly disrupted by a relation of man, woman, to the master. God is no respecter of persons. And so this relation where I'm a means to your ends is disrupted by this love that comes this way. Right? Now in modern philosophical terms, that's, you're still heteronymous, right? Because you give up your relationship here and give it that way. No, 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 no. This becomes the condition for the possibility of self-making. And that sensibility runs throughout my work, throughout my work, right? And I've been trying to figure it out. Let me just say this quickly, too. The pessimist is the optimist who pitched her, pes who pitched her ideals a bit too high. The pessimist is the optimist who's pitched her ideals a bit too high. I'm not Voltaire's Candide. Mm -hmm. Optimism is Pangloss running around saying, this is the best of all possible worlds. That could never come out of my mouth. Could never come out of my mouth, because I come out of a blues tradition. Out of what space could I ever say this is the best of all possible world? No, I come out of the tradition like B.B. King, nobody loves me, but my mama could be jiving too. It's a blues-soaked sensibility. So I'm never an optimist, and I can't be a pessimist, right? Because that's, that's, those are dialectically related. Mm -hmm. I'm hopeful. Right? I'm hopeful. And as Baldwin says, as I write in the book, hope is invented every day. Right? Does that make sense? Yeah. I hope so. so. Talking a lot. Um, it's part of the black prophetic tradition, Eddie, that you talk a lot about in the book, mm -hmm. um, which you could riff on now. But I want to actually sure. get a little more practical, too. Sure. One of the other things you mentioned in Begin Again, and I, and I, I think you say it in a, in a uh, almost wishful way, America needs a Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Why don't we have a Truth and Reconciliation Commission? Well, we can see that in real time now. You know, Brian Stevenson says in Montgomery, he says, remember, Truth and Reconciliation is sequential. First, you got to tell the truth in order to reconcile. <laughs> yeah. And then reconciliation sets, puts in place the conditions for repair. So in so many ways, we are battling over the story we tell ourselves. We don't want to admit what we've done, who we are. And so, and so let, let's segue back to black prophetic tradition that you talk about. Is that, a, is that a solution? It's in part one. You know, the mirror, the mirror can be tyrannical. You know, to hold a mirror up to oneself to see all of one's faults and foibles. Right? to create the conditions for the possibility for us to imagine ourselves differently. You know, there's a reason why. You know, when the, when the first Fourth of July celebrations used to be celebrated in New York, for example, in the 18, early 19th century, remember the Fourth of July wasn't always the day that we celebrated for independence. Actually, in New York, Fourth of July was a day used 
uh, by uh, the Colonization Society to raise funds in order to send free Africans back to Africa. Right? It's an irony of all ironies. But one of the first New York celebrations of July 4th, when African Americans used to show up to those celebrations, they would literally be attacked because they physically represented the contradiction of the celebration. They had to be removed from sight, right? And so oftentimes, the black prophetic tradition has, has been really about bringing into view that which we do not want to see, telling us the full story of who we are as best we can tell it, such so that it becomes the ground for a different way of imagining ourselves together, of being together, right? So it's in part part of the answer, it seems to me. Um, and to do so not in a way that throws us back on ourselves and creates walls, but to do so as a way of tilling the soil. And whenever you till soil, you have to turn it over. And it, it's, it's not, shall we say, a, um, a nice process if you've ever tilled soil before. It's, it's hard. You know, you got to turn it over. And so if we're going to turn over the soil so there could be a new planting, so that we can reap a new harvest. We have to do some hard work prior to. And that's going to require, I think that's going to require telling ourselves the truth about who we are and what we've done. There is no way, y'all, there is no way for us to believe that all of these black people in this country right now are in the condition that they're in because of the choices they've made alone. We've built the country true. We've built the country true. We act as if, and I write about this in the book, right? We act as if we didn't have a dual housing market, a dual labor market. We act as if we didn't have residential segregation. We act as if there wasn't uh, redlining. We act as if policies that really led to the formation of the vaunted American middle class didn't exclude black folk. We act as if we didn't have policies to reproduce everything that we see in New Orleans, everything that we see in New York, everything that I see in the Delta of Mississippi, everything that you see in Alabama, in the black belt of the country. All of this looks exactly the way it looks because of what we've done. And I'm not trying, I'm not trying to be, no, it looks the way it looks on purpose. And if we're going to finally change and release ourselves from this, we have to be just as deliberate in dismantling it as we were in creating it. And that's hard work. And I see it as my task, right, on the page, on television, running around the country, in every medium that I work in, to at least till the soil so that we can do that. Do you see that happening? I mean, I, I'm going to double barrel this question. You talk a lot about Dr. King in Begin Again and the relationship between Baldwin and King, but also about the fact that Dr. King, toward the end of his life, was talking about these very issues, income inequality, the, the structural racism of the country. He was anti-Vietnam War, and that was alienating him from a lot of the liberal establishment that had supported him. But that's the the prophetic vision that he was coming toward. Yeah, there's this wonderful conference about a month before Dr. King is assassinated. Uh, it's a rabbi, it's a, it's a rabbinical conference, and one of my heroes, Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel, is introducing him. Um, and it's a Q&A. And someone asks the question, what can I do to help? And Dr. King pauses before he transitions to talking about the Poor People's Campaign. And he says, and I'm paraphrasing, he says, we have to admit that America is a racist country. We have to concede, and here's my, one of my favorite lines, he says, or most insightful lines, we have to concede that racism still occupies the throne in this nation. And until we address that, I don't think we will get very far. A month later, the bottom, jaw of his, the bottom of his jaw is blown off and he's dead. What does it mean to admit that we're a racist country? <laughs> it's no different than admitting that we're all sinners, to put it in sectarian terms. And what is, 
what does that mean? To admit that one's racist doesn't, doesn't, it doesn't condemn you to the gallows, just as to admit that one is a sinner doesn't commit you to hell, right? That admission actually sets the stage for you to be born again, doesn't it? In Christian terms. So to admit it, but we can't even do that, right? So yeah, we're stuck. Uh, I don't want to break the spell, but um, there's a yeah, we can I'm ask gonna, some questions. We're gonna, um, I see people my good have friend. questions. Um, please come up, but and while you're coming up, I'll, I'll um, ask another question. Um, but is that the work is is admitting the lie? The lie is what prevents us from from seeing all of this because it comforts us. It's just it feels like they they work on each other. I don't know how to pull it apart. Yeah, they, they, it goes hand in hand, right? Yeah. So we can't do what Emerson calls us to do, and that is to reach for a higher self, if we don't em encounter, face, and confront the self that we currently are. If you don't admit who you are right now, then you can't leave that self behind. Yeah. This is at the heart of Emersonian perfectionism. You can't leave it behind. So if we are constantly evading right, a, a sincere and earnest and rich description of American life, then, you know, we're stuck. We're permanently stuck in the yeah. station, dock, at the dock of the station, it seems to me. I hope we're not stuck. Do you have a question? Oh, OK. And um, so I'm going to add this yeah. to the Bill of Obligations, Richard. <laughs> I don't have a question. Could you pull it down? Yes. I don't have, can you hear me? I don't yes. have a question. I just have to say, you are awesome. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. So, I have a question, but I think, <laughs> but I think you're awesome too, Eddie. I love you. Um, Thank you. So I went to see, and I know you didn't, um, Eric Holder last night. Did any anybody here see? Yeah. So, Eric has a different, bit of a different vision, and as a person who's been in government, right. I understand that you have a when you are in government you have a responsibility to use different kinds of language than we might be using here today. Mm -hmm. um, but he, he ended his remarks last night. He talked about this idea that you mentioned of the US as a, as a redeemer nation, as, a, as exceptional. And then he said it's the responsibility of every generation to achieve democracy and learn about it anew. And he said, we can do this. Is that just a, a government official talking? or? Um, how do you respond to that? It's probably just a governor, government official talking. <laughs> no, I think we can, you know, I think, you know, I, I have a fundamental faith in, in the possibility of, of us, um, of a new Jerusalem. I have a fundamental belief in that. Faith in our capacity to be otherwise. It, I have to have it. You know, it's all in our hands. You know, the world could either go to hell or it could be saved. It depends on us, depends upon us, what we do. But I think that it is, it is adolescent to the core that what is required of us to fight for the world we want, for the America that we want, is that we have to tell a story of our innocence. I think that's, yeah. that's the sign of refusing to grow up a kind of immaturity that, that, that chokes the life out of, right, the possibility of being otherwise, it seems to me. But I know we have some questions, and we'll go from, and we have one over here too, so yes. Pull it down. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's okay. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. All right. First of all, thanks are not enough. There's not enough words. So I would just like to mention Dr. Reverend Dr. Willie James Jennings from yeah. Yale, yeah. whose book, The Christian Imagination, Theological Origins of Race, is required reading for everybody, no matter creed or religion. Um, he really does unpack how 
Christianity monetized bodies mm -hmm. and used them to create this capitalistic structure. Mm -hmm. And our idolatry is money. Our idolatry is land, it's resources, and we will lay waste to anyone in order to achieve this morbid wealth that we equate with intelligence and virtue. Thank you. And I want to just thank you as a truth teller, and prophets are our truth tellers who point us in the right direction. And as a person who has worked very hard to reclaim her faith from the white Christian nationalism that we have in Louisiana, everywhere. Mm -hmm. When you drive in on I-12 to Livingston Parish, there is a billboard that says, Welcome to Livingston Parish, where we love our schools, our churches, and our guns. Yeah. yeah. That's what we value. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. So Thank much. you. Living, uh, Willie Williams, Dr. Willie, Willie Jennings. Willie Jennings, yeah, there you go. Thank you for being here. I always am excited about an opportunity to hear you speak. Thank you. Um, one of the thoughts when you um, spoke about South Africa, when I was there uh, with a class, mm -hmm. was um, some of the uh, white people that were around us at the time weren't willing to tell the truth. So when you said that, it made me think of that, of, of that instance that I experienced. And I guess it's about who's in power at the time who's willing to tell the truth. But actually, my question is, in your uh, experience of James Baldwin, do you, do you experience that he felt a part of the fabric of the problem, or did he experience himself outside critiquing the problem? No, no, it, he, was, he felt himself as, as an intimate um, with the American project. Um, you know, he says he had, to, he had to go overseas, he had to go to Paris in order to, you know, to, to uh, rid himself of a sense of self-hatred. There is, Baldwin laid, lays bare his soul on the page of seeing himself through the eyes of those who despise him, who despised him, you know? What else, I mean, there's a kind of American madness, this gap between who we say we are yeah. and our actual lives. And then there's the kind of madness that ensues among those people who have to bear the burden of American madness. So what else is double consciousness but a form of madness? Yeah. What else is it to see oneself through the eyes of another who despises you, right? And so there, Baldwin and Eldridge Cleaver and others, they don't get it, but he's constantly trying to deal with how wounded and traumatic growing up in a country um, like the America he grew up in, right, actually was. I mean. Rick, you've written on Mandela in, this, in the South African context. What, what, just going back to that truth and reconciliation moment, what did you see as, you, as part of the struggle of, of telling the truth in that space? Um, I don't want to spend too long on that. This. The best biography of Mandela ever written right here. So let's. Um, I did. I had a great privilege of working with, with uh, Mandela in the 90s. Um, the difference about South Africa is all the terms that we use are reversed there. So they had an oppressed majority, not an oppressed minority. And, and the white minority would talk about the rights of the minority to try to protect their power. What happened is that it, it became a black majority government. He became a black majority president. And in some ways, the, the lack of white acknowledgement almost didn't matter anymore because the new dispensation had happened. And he already forgave people before, <laughs> before they had to reckon with their own honesty, which was how he got to black majority government. Indeed. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yes. Hello, Dr. Glaude. Dr. Glaude, I, I feel like we know each other. You're in my living room all the time. <laughs> Sometimes even in the bedroom. <laughs> in any event, I, I, first, I first met you through Network News, and uh, whoever thought I'd be lucky enough to be in the same room with you. 
but I could not help but wanting to share with you uh, something else that I heard from another brilliant professor who I don't know nearly as well as you because he isn't on MSNBC. <laughs> uh, but I believe he was from the University of Texas. Mm. Uh, and he and his family every Sunday had dinner with three other families, uh, two of whom were white and I think one of whom was Hispanic. And he wanted to be able to say what you said about uh, redlining and housing and what have you. And he used the most brilliant example. He said that they played Monopoly on Sunday night. And the parents played the first hour. And the African Americans were not able to buy any property. Mm. Uh, they had to pay taxes, and they didn't. They weren't able to go, pass, go, and collect two hundred dollars. And so you can imagine that right. the other people could buy property and amass wealth. And after dinner, their children all played, but they only played with the amount of money that their parents had been able to collect. Mm -hmm. And it was so very clear. And I just wanted to share Thank that. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. End up with, you remember on the Monopoly game, what is Baltic Avenue, the, the, the projects? Yeah. <laughs> $200, you can't go, but anyway. Uh, thank you so much for that. Hi. 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 Um, well, I agree with you on the Obama. I call it the Obama bubble. Uh, it was like watching the Cosbys. I grew up in that environment. And he showed white people what black America was supposed to be in what they want us to be. We went to Selma. That's my husband. He's got a question, too. <laughs> we, we went to Selma last Sunday. Selma looks like Ukraine. There is nothing in Selma. Mm. They were hit by a hurricane two years ago and a tornado in January. There is no industry. There is no possibilities. It is desolate. And Biden came and spoke. And we took our grandson to see this. And my 13-year-old said, forget walking the bridge, Biden. Turn around and walk the block mm. because it's desolate. Why are we not addressing poverty? Good question. Um, some people are trying to address poverty. Uh, Bishop Barber and the Poor People's Campaign are trying to do this in this current moment. Um, I think the most, um, the most toxic combination to arrest significant change in this country is not only the loud racist, it's not only the white liberal who's afraid that we're going too far, it's also selfishness and greed. And so there is a sense in which poverty um, remains a kind of bad word. And we could tell a story about why that's the case. And, uh, but we're in a moment, I, wanna, I think so, we're in a moment where a particular ideological um, economic philosophy is collapsing right in front of us. And the question is, what will take its place? Um, and we have to insist that a more equitable system around economic distribution does. I mean, but we can go through that. But I want to get to your husband over here really quickly. Yes. OK. Bear with me. I'm going to give you a perspective. we got 18 seconds, Doc. 18 seconds. OK. <laughs> Last week, we had a huge conversation. I'm an old college football coach from the south side of Chicago. Was cast on recruiting Mississippi, Alabama, Louisiana. I got in a huge debate with one of my ex-players. I want your perspective on the difference in racism in the North. This guy is from the South who has moved to Boston. Young white guy, well, I can't call him young, all my players are in their 50s. Right. In the South, I gave him my perspective and it was on the backdrop of why are we seeing the phenomena of the Karens in the North? And we don't necessarily see it in the South. And as a black man, I see very different differences between racism in the North versus the South. I can deal with it here because I know what I'm dealing with. I'd like your perspective. Well, I, that's a hard question, and we're already beyond time. But 
there's an intimacy that has everything to do with the nature of, of, of the environment in the South. But I'll answer it in this way. As long as Malcolm X said, as long as you're south of the Canadian border, you're in the South. Eddie Cloud, everybody, thank you. Thank you so much for joining us today. Dr. Cloud will be.